Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 12th meeting of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee for 2022, which this week we are conducting in hybrid format. At Agenda Item 1, we have consideration of whether to take Agenda Items 3 and 4 in private. Item 3 is consideration of evidence heard this morning, and Item 4 is consideration of our work programme. Do we agree to take these items in private? That is agreed. Thank you very much. Our next agenda item is our first evidence session in respect of our inquiry into increasing energy prices. The recent significant increase in wholesale and domestic energy prices have quite rightly received a lot of attention in recent weeks and are causing real concerns for many people across Scotland. Uh, this inquiry will look in more detail at what is causing these price increases what can be done to alleviate them and how, we can, uh, uh, how help can best be given to households most in need. Our focus in relation to this global issue, which is partly reserved to the UK Parliament and partly devolved to the Scottish Parliament, will be on the Scottish Government's powers in this area and what, ste what steps can be taken. To discuss some of these issues, I am pleased to welcome our first panel this morning, who are joining us remotely. We have Dr Matthew Hannan, Reader in Sustainable Energy Policy and Business Models, Hunter Centre for Entrepreneurship, University of Strathclyde, Tim Lord, Head of Climate Change, Phoenix Group, and Associate Senior Fellow for Net Zero Institute for Global Change, and Dr Richard Lowes, Senior Associate, the Regulatory Assistance Project. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. It's a pleasure to have you here. We've got around 70, 75 minutes allocated for this uh, panel session. So we will move uh, straight to questions and I will begin. Um, as I said, in recent months we have seen significant increases in wholesale energy prices and as a consequence domestic energy prices as well, with a number of different factors contributing to this upward trend in energy costs. Um, it would be good to get the panel's views on the general sense of direction uh, of uh, energy prices in the short term, medium and, and longer term. In other words, what does the panel see happening with energy prices over short term, medium term and long term? I appreciate that's a very difficult question. No one here has a crystal ball, but I'm sure you all are monitoring developments on the supply and the, the demand side and also keeping close tabs with what's happening in the market. So to the extent you can, it would be great to get your sense of what we could expect to see with energy prices. Uh, going forward. And in terms of putting that question to the panel, perhaps I could ask Dr Hannan to go first, followed by Tim Lord and then Dr Lowes. So Dr Hannan, over to you if that would be okay. Thank you. Many thanks and good morning to the committee. Um, no, it's a very good question and one um, I've certainly given a lot of consideration to. The, some of the, the analysis in terms of energy prices going forward and how the market is going to react, I think it's fair to say some of the, the leading commentary has been from Cornwall Insights. Um, and the, the consultancy there is pointing, uh, I think recently, just a few days ago, released analysis suggesting that they, they don't foresee a great deal of change uh, within the next couple of years. So their, their assumption is that the, the price cap um, come October will rise again. Um, and at that point, we will see a rise from just shy of 2000 uh, that we saw for the average dual fuel um, electricity and gas bill paid by direct debit, um, just shy of £2,000 going up to roughly £2,600. Um, and they got it pretty spot on last time around. So I, I would uh, certainly sit up and take notice of, of their forecast. And they, their uh, headline, I guess, is that hopes fade for a significant price cap drop in 23 and 24. Um, the, the main driver being that they don't expect wholesale prices for energy to drop anytime soon. Um, and I think we, we can expect in that short term period over the next two years to brace ourselves for record uh, energy prices. I, I think the, the medium to long term, there's probably two key factors which I expect will start to um, start to set the scene for whether we ex we see bills starting to drop. And that's the extent to um, how quickly we start to decouple our energy consumption from gas. That's both for power generation, uh, but also for heat. Um, and, and I think associated with that is that some of the difficulties around decoupling uh, wholesale electricity prices from gas more broadly. So even if we, we aren't consuming 
um, much gas, uh, the price of gas will dictate uh, to, to a large extent the price of electricity. Um, I think the other key factor here and the key trend, which for me is, is, is most important, is the extent to which we can drive forward on energy efficiency, um, and particularly fabric first approach. Um, Scotland and more broadly the UK um, are, are not going quickly on this, and we've seen from government support um, uh, programs such as the energy company obligation um, that we we are um, certainly versus this time ten years ago we have uh, slowed down significantly, um, and it was interesting to see this morning, for instance. Um, just looking over some of the data around how much Scotland had uh, had achieved in terms of loft insulations. If we take the period 10 years ago to uh, 2011 to 2012, we were insulating roughly a quarter of a million lofts uh, through the energy company obligation or its predecessor, CERT. Between 2018 and 2019, that was just 5,000 lofts. So we, and you know, in the context of a unprecedented energy crisis, um, we really need to step up our, our ambition and to exercise whatever devolved powers we're able to muster, but also to, to work alongside the UK government to, to ensure that the scale of ambition with regards to retrofit um, is, 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 is up um, to the job in terms of the crisis that we face and, is, um, and, 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 and that ambition meets the scale of the challenge. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hanna, for that for that comprehensive uh, answer. You, you set the scene well, and I'm sure we'll pick up on a number of those points. Um, same question to Tim Lord, please. Thank you, and uh, thanks. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to be here uh, today. I mean, I think I'd agree with a lot of uh, what Dr. Hanna said, but, but a couple of points to add. I mean, I think the first thing to say is, you know, it's worth repeating kind of what's driving these high energy prices. It's essentially high gas prices and high fossil fuel prices. Um, why is that happening? I mean, I think there are three main factors. The first is is the demand recovery post COVID, and it's worth remembering that although the Ukraine crisis has clearly exacerbated the situation in, in international markets, the, the increase in prices does predate uh, the Ukraine situation. Secondly, we've had um, supply shocks of varying kinds, obviously in particular uh, as a result of the, of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And I think thirdly, we have insufficiently strong investment signals in energy production, um, by which I don't simply mean fossil fuel, but, but more broadly, um, uh, and also in terms of demand signals for energy reduction, uh, as, as Dr. Hannon mentioned. Now, to address your question directly, kind of what's going to happen to forward prices, um, forward prices are very, very difficult to predict, and I think we've, we've certainly learned that this winter. I think the, um, the UK government estimates of forward gas prices had a high scenario of around 75 pence a therm for gas. We've seen prices well above 200, um, I think, on average, and peaking you know, to three or 400 pence a therm, which is kind of off the charts uh, in terms of predictions. But those predictions were not outliers. In, in general, this is uh, what we've seen in markets has far exceeded what anyone predicted. So I, I'd be cautious about making um, forecasts. Having said that, I think some of the issues that we're seeing are, are structural and, and are likely to persist. And secondly, there's the question of how high prices are going to be, but there's also the question of volatility. And I think what we are very likely to see in the next few years is much more volatile prices in international fossil commodity markets. And in some ways, that's as big a problem as high prices in the sense that it's very challenging for investors and very challenging for consumers. You know, the energy bill is really the only one of the major bills that we have, which you know, can change quite dramatically um, from uh, one period to the next, which obviously is, is a huge problem for consumers with constrained budgets um, trying to budget. Um, in terms of what we do about that, I mean, I'm no doubt we'll come on to this, but very quickly, you know, there's, there's basically four options. We can increase the supply of fossil fuels. In my view, uh, that won't have a huge impact because of the, uh, the UK's relatively small role in international markets and because of the timescales associated with that. We can reduce demand, as, as, as Dr. Hannon mentioned, which um, can both reduce costs in the long term, but also help in the relatively short term and directly help some of the consumers who most need it. And we, we can move our supply away from fossil fuels to reduce that dependence on international market through investment in renewables and so on. Uh, and we can provide direct financial support. And in the end, any strategy basically has those four um, uh, clubs in its bag, as it were. And the question is, in what combination do we use them and how do we use them in a way that ensures we're, we're helping to address the price rises in the short term, as well as make us more uh, structurally ready uh, to manage them in the long term. Thanks. Great, Tim. Thank, thank you very much for those uh, insights. And uh, I think you anticipated one of the questions we had in terms of how, how to deal with this, uh, some of these challenges. Uh, Dr. Lowe, same question to you, please. 
Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks uh, for inviting me to be here. Um, so I'd, I'd agree with everything that's been said already, really. Um, and as, as Tim pointed out, there are two things that came together to produce what was a perfect and you know unpredictable storm, um, the post-COVID bounce back um, and then the Russian war. Um, and so um, a huge amount depends on, on what happens with both of those things. So, so does growth keep going? Um, and, and we're seeing um, fluctuations around the world with that. But the big impact locally, at least because of our links to the European market, will be the war in Russia. Um, and the terrible situation, sorry, the war in Ukraine and the terrible situation there. Um, and it's difficult to predict how that will, how that will play out, I think. Um, in terms of uh, prices, um, you should never ask anyone to predict energy prices in the long term, certainly. Um, in the short term, um, I think the, the key thing to note is that people haven't started feeling the pinch yet. So although the prices, uh, the, the short term fluctuations in the gas price, which went up to huge numbers um, in October and more recently, People haven't really felt these bill impacts yet. Um, and so while we roughly know what the bill impacts will be, people's direct debits may only have just gone up. Um, prepayment meter prices have only have just gone up and it's been a mild winter. Um, and so a key issue is um, in the short term, the prices, we know what they are. They're high. They're about possibly double what they were last year. Um, and can people pay their bills? That's the biggest short term price issue. Um, in the medium term, the gas futures market still looks very high. Um, so we're not likely to see any let up, I don't think, before the end of 2023, um, looking at most of the predictions and forecasts that I've seen. Um, so that's at least a year and a half um, of struggle and high costs. Um, and beyond then, it really is a question of who knows, I'm afraid. Um, we know what's cheap, though. So we do know the things that are cost effective already. So we know, for example, that insulation is cost effective. We know that renewables are very cost effective. Um, and the biggest price impact, I guess, over the long term is that everything that was already cost effective for meeting net zero, uh, whether that be onshore wind, solar, efficiency, heat pumps, electric vehicles, all of those things are now relatively cheaper. Um, and there's a financial question there about how you allow people to, to reap those benefits or those relative benefits. Um, but basically, uh, short term, it's high. Medium term, it's high. Long term, we don't know, um, but a, a sensible strategy would be to eliminate or certainly try and reduce your exposure to fossil fuels um, as much as you can. And that's gas and oil, um, because both prices have, have gone up significantly. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lowe. The, the panel have certainly set out uh, a great uh, number of issues that uh, the, the committee members will want to explore. My follow-up question um, is about the policy response. Uh, what would be the best policy response you would like to see from the Scottish Government and the UK Government to deal with the, the short-term, medium-term challenges, as well as those longer-term structural issues facing the sector, bearing in mind, obviously, the overriding priority of reducing climate emissions? Uh, I think uh, all of you mentioned demand, uh, managing demand and the ability, perhaps, in the short term to address the demand side of the equation. So I'd appreciate some thoughts on that. In terms of uh, putting the questions to the panel, perhaps Dr. Hannan again, then Tim Lord, uh, to be followed by Dr. Lowe's. Many thanks. Yes, uh, another excellent question. So I think in, in my mind, there's two, two objectives. So there's no point in setting policy without a clear objective in, in mind. And the objective should be twofold, I think, apart from reducing carbon emissions, just in terms of cost alone. One is about reducing overall costs for the system. And what I mean by that is that the cost that the average consumer faces in terms of satisfying their energy needs. That's a domestic customer. That's about you know, comfort, standard of living. Um, if it's a commercial customer, it's about you know, what, what it costs to, to operate uh, on a cost-effective basis. Um, but the other objective here is around a just transition and around who pays uh, and how much these different segments of, of society and the economy pay. So. In that round, I think the first objective about reducing the overall cost, obviously we've, we've spoken about uh, demand reduction, but it's also about bringing online the cheapest forms of power, which um, Dr. Lowe's points out quite rightly. And obviously with onshore, solar, increasingly offshore, we need to do all we can to bring those online. That isn't just about a subsidy um, regime, a planning regime, a consenting regime that encourages that, but it's also about having the networks in place to transport that power reliably and cost, uh, cost effectively, cheaply from uh, areas of, of, of high supply to areas of high demand. 
Um, but I think that point about who pays is a really important one. And particularly the issue around how we raise policy costs. Now, there's a, a fantastic piece of research undertaken by colleagues at the University of Leeds, uh, Anne Owen and John Barrett, that looks about how we raise um, uh, costs, cover these subsidies. And typically we do this um, for, for energy and, and, and climate change through our energy bills. Um, and we raise this on bills um, and as, as a levy. So many of you will have, have, have be aware of that. Um, and, and they look at different ways in which we can raise funds. And, and one uh, option that they explore is through general taxation, which obviously presents a more progressive way of doing this because the highest earners pay proportionally more towards covering those, those costs. Um, there's also a question about uh, how we balance those costs between gas and electricity bills. I certainly know UK government is actively exploring uh, shifting those costs from uh, uh, which are typically or higher on ele uh, electricity bills, those green levies, onto gas bills. That might uh, help tick the carbon emissions box. Um, and, and obviously, uh, and, and I, I know Dr. Lowe has, has, uh, has, has explored this with colleagues in the past, um, but it also may start to increase the cost of those on gas, and many of those homes may be fuel poor. So, I, yeah, I just want to present to the committee, there's, there's two, op two objectives, reducing overall cost, and then asking the question, well, who pays and, and how do we pay for that in the most progressive and, and fair manner? Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for that, Dr. Hannan. Um, I, I know some of my colleagues want to address some of those issues uh, after me. Uh, same question to Tim Lord, please. Sure, thank you. So, so I think just building on that point about objectives, you know, in, 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 the, in the relatively short term, what are our objectives? We need, we need to get prices down in a fair way, as Dr. Hannan says. And secondly, we need to reduce our dependence on commodity markets. I think it's worth pausing to think um, in the net zero context, what would you do differently as a result of that? And I think actually, if there's only one sort of thin silver lining around what's happening at the moment, is that the things you need to do for net zero, and obviously Scotland has more ambitious net zero objectives than the rest of the UK, are exactly the same things that you would want to do in order to achieve those, those uh, objectives um, in the context of this energy crisis. The second point I've made by way of preface is around investment. We have a huge investment requirement across energy supply and demand. So UK-wide, the Association of British Insurers estimated that as 2.7 trillion to 2035. That probably equates to something like two to 300 billion in Scotland alone on a population basis, perhaps a little bit higher um, given um, Scotland's you know, capabilities around renewables, et cetera. So, a crucial point is what are we doing to enable that investment to flow? And that includes everything from the very largest, you know, offshore wind renewables projects to people installing insulation in their homes. Just to, to address your question directly, I, I think it's worth breaking down into short, medium and long term. So in the short term, what can you do in particular for the, the coming winter? Because as Dr. Lowe said, like we haven't really seen anything yet in terms of the impact uh, of this painful as it has been already. So the first is around reducing demand. And we shouldn't treat energy efficiency as a silver bullet. We can't insulate every home in the country uh, by this winter, but we can start really biting chunks out of that relatively quickly if the funding and the support is, is there to enable people to do that. Secondly, personally, I would like to see governments doing much more to talk to people about the behavioural things that they can do. You know, turning your thermostat down by one degree can cut energy consumption by or heat consumption by 10%. Um, changing boiler flow temperatures sounds very technical, but isn't very hard to do. Can save somewhere between 5 and 10%. So people can do things directly themselves, uh, which, uh, which support all of this. Secondly, in terms of the medium term, I'm afraid I won't say anything terribly surprising to you. We need investment in renewables, but it's not just about the money and the investment frameworks. It's also about removing the planning constraints, for example, that mean that offshore wind and onshore wind projects take a lot longer to get from project conception to delivery than they need to, uh, although Scotland's certainly in a better position on onshore wind uh, than, uh, than other parts of the UK. And then thirdly, around the long term, um, around investment, you know, potentially in, in nuclear and so on, I, I think looking at those kinds of things is sensible when we look to what, what does a net zero power system in the 2030s actually look like and how do we make sure that in a very, very renewables heavy system we can continue uh, to service demand when we need to. But the strategy now needs to be looking at all three of those timeframes. Um, I, I think the risk with the UK, uh, the UK government energy security strategy is it looks much more at the third and the long term than it does at the short and medium. Thanks very much, Tim. And same question to Dr. Lowe's, please. 
Thanks. Yeah, I, I totally agree with um, Tim on that point regarding the, the long term nature of the energy security strategy that came out from um, UK government a couple of weeks ago. It just seems to be looking at the long term rather than the short term. Um, I guess when you think about what a policy response should be, you need to think about what the problems you're trying to solve are, really. Um, and I guess that the, there's obviously the climate change issue that needs to be resolved, um, but energy security has come to the fore um, in, in, a, in a way that I don't think anyone expected it to, actually. Um, and there'd always been a sort of a, a relaxed assumption that we could rely on fossil gas imports as we gently weaned ourselves off them in the move to net zero. Um, so, so you need to tackle both of those things. Um, I guess the I'll, I'll sort of repeat what I said before. The first point is that these prices haven't hit people yet. Um, and so the most important thing is that people have got enough money to be able to eat and keep their houses warm. Um, and if anyone's struggling, then they need to be offered some sort of support from benefits or from the system, um, because uh, next winter will be extremely tough, undoubtedly, um, particularly if it's cold. Um, and, and that should be at the forefront of everyone's mind, because that is going to be the key issue um, that um, is a direct health impact, basically, a direct social and welfare impact. Um, when we think about longer term energy strategies, I think there are some interesting parallels to draw between what happened in the 60s and 70s. Um, so similar price spikes um, around oil um, led to strategies in Scandinavia and the Nordic countries um, to wean themselves totally off oil um, for heating. Um, and so those countries led significant decadal, multi-decadal energy efficiency and electrification policies, um, which now means that Sweden has the, the world's largest heat pump market, Norway's, I think, second behind. Um, in Denmark, there are huge uh, heat networks, and it's one of the world's largest heat network markets. And those were rational responses to um, an oil price issue. Um, and I think this issue, you know, the price impacts that we've seen over the past few months are certainly as big as those oil crises in the 60s and 70s. Um, so um, that's one parallel. The other parallel is the expansion of the UK's gas grid in, in the 60s and 70s as well. Um, and that happened for many different reasons um, to what was going on in Scandinavia. But that followed um, a discovery of North Sea oil and gas. There was suddenly a huge amount of gas ready to be tapped into that we, we knew could heat homes and, and power power stations eventually. Um, and the response to that was to um, convert the UK's gas grid to run on uh, natural gas rather than to run on town gas um, and to expand the gas grid. Um, and I guess the, the, the parallel there is that we, we're running out of gas from the North Sea um, very rapidly. We know it will basically all be gone by 2035, 2040. Um, and uh, at the same time, the costs of renewables have, have plummeted totally. Um, so a strategic response would be um, a national strategy based on energy efficiency um, and electrification, um, because they're the resources that we know that we have available now and are increasingly cost effective. Um, so um, I think the other important thing to say, actually, is in the short term, um, while you can't deliver lots of energy efficiency immediately, um, steps can be made to bolster that market, because actually there are things that you can do, many of them that Tim have mentioned, but I'd, I'd be a bit bolder, I think, on delivery and deployment. Um, you can insulate a lot more lofts if you really go for it over the summer period. Um, and so um, there should also be a short-term impetus around energy efficiency as well, um, but as long as that's part of a, a longer-term pathway. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lowes. Let me bring in other committee members. Uh, I think the opening remarks have covered uh, a huge number of uh, really interesting issues. Fiona Hislop, please. Uh, thank you very much and good morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, please feel free to expand on your previous remarks. I'm very interested in that historical context we've just heard of from, from Dr. Lowes and uh, that kind of rapid change uh, to accelerate the um, electrification uh, particularly in Scandinavia in the 60s and 70s. Some of us are old enough to remember 1973 and the oil crisis and the implications that had uh, very practically. Uh, what can we learn and how quickly, and to Dr Lowe's first, how quickly the response was in the 60s and 70s and what should we be expecting now? Are there any lessons uh, to learn from that? To, I'll come to Dr Lowe's first on that. Uh, thank you. That's a great question, actually. Um, I'm afraid there's no simple answer to this, um, and that's because the response to it was a very strategic response that took many decades. Um, and so if you look at the example of energy efficiency and heating, and I think it's fair to say that, for example, Sweden went on energy efficiency first and then went on electrification more. Um, but if you look at the example of heat pump deployment, um, which really started to kick off only in the late 80s and 90s, actually, 
what that relied on was um, continuous support. Um, so they had a target. Um, there were measures introduced, including carbon taxes, grant support, skill support. Um, all of those things happened together, um, but they were maintained over the long term. And that was to build up the base from nothing um, and then to end up in a situation where now it's, it's second nature for you to get a heat pump if you get your heating system replaced um, in Sweden or even in Norway. Um, and so I'm afraid in the short term, um, there's not much that can be done in, initially to drive those things apart from setting up the framework to eventually deliver them. I know that doesn't sound particularly helpful, um, but that's how you do it. it. It can't just all be done in a year. It, it's going to take decades. Um, but the, the earlier you start, the easier it is. And can I bring in Dr. Hannan on this and any other international comparatives, either historical or contemporary, you might want to reflect on, Dr. Hannan? Yes, absolutely. I echo the fact that this is a, a very important question, and I think history does have, have some lessons. I'm minded of, from your question about what Japan did post Fukushima in terms of trying to reduce its energy uh, demand. It lost many of its nuclear reactors, some of which are still um, mothballed today. Um, and we, their, their program there, known as uh, Setsudan, excuse the, the, the lack of um, native tongue there, but um, they achieve roughly a 20% reduction quite quickly on their energy demand. Um, and, and with that, it, and this was basically trying to kind of cut the fat, uh, if, if for want of a better word, around um, maybe what was running, what wasn't essential, um, maybe desirable. And I, I don't think the UK or Scotland has positioned itself on a war footing in terms of uh, tackling this crisis. I don't think we, as, uh, as Dr. Lowe's quite rightly says, we're aware of the scale of the pain that is coming, but until we feel it, I don't think um, the, um, that, that crisis management will kick in, and I'm concerned about that. And I think that crisis management doesn't just come from government, but it also comes from uh, people around the kitchen table at home about actually feeling the pain of this and positioning themselves. But they need to be helped to do this. And one of our greatest tools that we have uh, is energy advocacy. So many of these useful um, centers of information, some of which are on our high street. I, I myself am chair and trustee of an organization called South Seeds, which is a community environmental charity based in the south side of Glasgow. And we quite literally have a shop front there where we bring people in who are struggling to pay their bills um, and we speak to them and help them to identify not only uh, the scale of the problem they're facing in terms of their energy bills, but what the causes are at home. Some of that will be around um, energy efficiency, in going back to the Fukushima example, things that they are running which they can do without. But more often than not, they're already cut right to the bone. And these energy advocacy services are stretched to breaking point. This was even before the price cap rise on the 1st of April. At South Seeds, we were running, um, typically we'd be expecting a few days, maybe a week to, to offer consultation. Um, it was up to three weeks before the price cap rise. Now, my concern is that we have some fantastic people in these organizations offering support, providing step-by-step um, -step guides uh, and actively helping people to reduce their demand, but also providing them emergency support um, through things like the energy redress scheme. But if you cannot get an appointment at these organizations, you cannot receive the help. And there are people waiting, literally waiting, for these appointments to get their energy bills paid for. So I, I would I, just to summarize there, I think we 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 need to we need to treat this like a crisis. I think we're calling it a crisis, but I don't think we're quite treating it like a crisis yet. And part of that is providing face-to-face -face support to advocate solutions and to help unpick these very complex issues that people are dealing with, because it's not just energy that, uh, prices that are feeding into this cost of living crisis, but it's a myriad of interconnected uh, pressures and, and households need somebody uh, to put an arm around them and help them. Thank you. And can I now move to, to Tim Lord, if you have any reflections, uh, Tim Lord, on the international and historical lessons we might learn. But also, secondly, if this is a crisis, as we've heard, and it is, uh, we also know that we're facing the climate crisis. We've, you've referenced the 
um, well, the trillions of funds that are needed to to be invested. We've heard from Dr. Hannan that a fabric first approach to help in the, the immediate short term um, is, is going to be essential. Uh, is there no way, therefore, we can ask the private sector and for them to mobilise themselves to help in that investment in the short term uh, in an area that perhaps might not be as attractive of, as uh, offshore wind investment, for example, but will make a real difference to people's lives? this winter if that kind of mobilisation can take place. So it's quite a large canvas there, but any reflections would be helpful. Sure, absolutely. And, and, and I think there, there are kind of five key things I would draw out when you look at the international comparisons and also the historic comparisons here in the UK, including more recently through uh, energy efficiency programmes such as the Green Deal, which perhaps, um, uh, or not perhaps, we certainly weren't as effective um, as we hoped they would be. Um, I think the first I think it's really important to look at this from the consumer perspective. Um, and the first thing I would say is about information, where you know something like half of people don't realise their gas boilers create greenhouse gas emissions, um, so they don't necessarily appreciate um, that context. That isn't their fault. That's because that hasn't been explained to them very well. And secondly, when you try and get information about your own home's uh, energy performance, uh, things like the EPC certificates and so on, are, are not necessarily providing very high quality of information. So I think that's the first thing. Uh, that we collectively uh, can address, and I think the government can play a really big role in addressing is helping people to understand uh, the context of their energy use, and in particular, in their own homes. The second challenge is around capital costs uh, and um, the fact that those capital costs are high, and they are higher at the moment in general for low carbon heating, uh, for high carbon heating solutions. But that doesn't have to be the case. We've seen other countries tackle that, and I think you know to to directly address your point about the private sector, I think absolutely. The private sector uh, can and should be investing more in that. We're obviously a very large investor uh, across the economy uh, through uh, through our pensions business in particular. And and what we really need there is not the government to just pay for all of this stuff. But what we need is is, is better investment frameworks in place. We need seed funding. We need you know things like interest free loans can have huge potential. Um, grants uh, to some degree in particular for those uh, on lower incomes. And what that can enable us to do hopefully is to package those up into into larger uh, potential investment opportunities that the private sector absolutely should uh, and I think is ready to be quicker uh, in getting behind. The third issue is around the running costs. So at the moment, or well, certainly you know, until a few months ago, the running costs of, for example, a heat pump were higher uh, than for a, a gas boiler. That isn't necessarily the case now. Interestingly, heat pumps potentially cheaper to run uh, in most contexts than uh, gas boilers because of the rise uh, in the gas price. But at the moment, we do load a lot of policy costs uh, on, in particular, for older renewables projects, including in, in Scotland, uh, in particular, um, given how renewables have grown, in particular in Scotland. And, and we need to look at how those are balanced across bills and across general taxation, because that is providing a direct disincentive for people to move away from fossil gas and on to, to lower carbon uh, and also low, yeah, potentially uh, lower costs forms of heating. The fourth point, I think, is about clarity of policy direction. Um, these are often, you know, most boiler purchases are distressed purchases when your boiler breaks and you need a new one. Um, I recently looked into getting a heat pump um, and I was told that the soonest I could probably get one was 2024. So that's not hugely helpful. Um, and I think we need clearer policy direction to enable people to make those decisions around their own homes, which takes me to the fifth and in some ways the most important point which underpins all of this, which is around the supply chain which will enable people to decarbonise the heating in their homes, which at the moment is simply at, at far too small a scale, but I think can, if we do all the other things that I've talked about, scale quite rapidly over the next few years, so we can start to deliver the you know, million, million and a half uh, homes a year um, having, having low carbon heating installations across the UK uh, by 2030. Thank you. And the other area I wanted to cover was uh, energy market reform. I, can, I might come to Dr. Hannan first on that. You talked about decoupling gas, for example, um, in terms of the, the price setting. Uh, so I'd, I'd be interested in your views on uh, energy market reform, what's needed and when, and should we be shifting to, to ensure that the energy market is designed to ensure secure um, and affordable and sustainable energy? And if you can unpack that uh, separation of, the, of gas from that pricing market, that would be helpful as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's a very live topic, actually, and one that I, I don't profess to have the, the answer immediately on. And I think there's a, in fact, I th believe the government is looking to consult ways um, on, on how to, to do so going forward. I mean, the, the, the principles are, are, are 
simple in that we can't how if, if you are if you have a global commodity um, how do you start to uh, insulate the uh, effects of gas prices on, on electricity and i think one option going forward which is a part of what will likely be a raft of much wider uh, policy and regulatory change is consuming locally uh, generated electricity um, in, in in that local area so there is um, there's legislation which is I, I think it's first or second reading in, in uh, House of Commons currently which is around the local electricity supply bill and um, which is about trying to lay some of the framework and groundwork um, to enable small electricity suppliers who normally aren't actually able to enter that marketplace because it's so costly and time consuming and administratively burdensome to meet the licensing uh, arrangements to actually be able to produce electricity and sell this directly and locally. And in doing so, you can start to um, a, a, arrange um, means by which you are you are insulating yourselves from from the, the wider market, as, as it were. Um, but I, I, I won't profess to have the answer directly to this, and I think it's a very live topic, so I'll, I'll maybe defer to my, uh, my fellow, uh, fellow panel members on this one. So I was going to suggest we may, might move on to the convener for um, other members to come in, but I think if the other panel members have anything to say on energy market reform, please indicate, I think, during our chat uh, function, or you can bring it in when somebody else is asking a question. I think Tim Lord might want to say something, and then I'll pass back after him to... OK, thank you, Tim. No, I'm very happy to come in, come in later, but, but, but very briefly, you know, the market that we have is designed around gas so that is low capital cost high running cost and flexible supply the market we need is almost the opposite of that yeah. it's high capital cost low running cost and flexible demand so i think actually in some ways one of the most significant announcements the government made last week was to institute a program of market reform i think i think it's absolutely essential that they do that but within doing that the key is is about fairness for consumers because often when we think about you know zero carbon houses of the future they're four bedroom detached houses with solar panels on the roof and electric vehicles on the driveway and we need to make sure that whatever reforms we take forward um deliver an efficient market outcome but also delivers an outcome that works for consumers of all types okay dr Lowe's, did you indicate did you want to come in on that uh yes please thanks I, i'd say there are there are two two key elements so one is around the fact that there's still no environmental price reflected into gas, um, which is basically sort of what Tim just said. Um, but um, there are issues with changing that because um, if you push the, the gas price up even further, um, that will, will cause issues for people. So if, if any reform is done there, it needs to be in the context of, of wider changes. Um, the, the biggest issue that I can see at the moment in relation to, to gas um, is that the power price is, is effectively set by the gas price for much of the time. And so even though we've got lots of renewable electricity coming online, we're not feeling all of the financial benefits of that. Um, and so there is discussion of a move to potentially talk to, uh, to move towards a market where you, you have separate markets for renewables that can run all the time, which are the, the, high, uh, the low operational cost, um, but high um, investment cost. Um, and you separate that out to have a, a bifurcated gas market. So effectively two markets alongside each other. Um, a lot hinges on what will, um, Develop with the retail market review, um, and the, the UK government is yet to respond to that consultation, but um, we'll see that, that hopefully in a few months. Thank you. And clearly, a lot of this is reserved to the UK government, but it's very helpful in our, our, our rounded analysis. Uh, I'll pass back to the convener now. Uh, thanks very much, Fiona. Let me bring in uh, Mark Roskill. Mark, over to you, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, you mentioned previously around uh, the issue of planning, um, particularly with onshore winds and, and solar. Planning's obviously devolved. I think there was some reference to planning within the uh, UK energy strategy in relation to English planning system. But what more do you think the Scottish Government could be doing to develop onshore wind and, and solar with not just planning, but other, other aspects as well of devolved responsibilities? Um, could I start with um, Dr. Hannan, please? Yeah, thank you. So um, I think, you know, when we compare what Scotland's achieved in terms of onshore wind versus uh, England, for instance, um, uh, since I think the, the moratorium on onshore wind was uh, effectively put in place during the Cameron government, I believe, 2015, um, very little onshore wind has come online in England, whereas in Scotland we've, we've, um, we've rolled out a significant amount. And obviously, you know, Whiteley's wind farm just south of Glasgow is testament to that. Uh, and what you know one of the largest onshore wind farms in Europe so I, I think the first thing to say 
is that those devolved powers around planning, alongside some of the uh, subsidies that were in place uh, during the mid uh, uh, 2010s, enabled onshore to come online. The onshore uh, renewable rollout, I would say, in Scotland has, has uh, maybe suffered somewhat at the hands of how the contracts for difference were, were, were structured in, uh, in recent years. Slowly but surely, we've seen onshore wind start to inch back in with things like remote island wind. Uh, now it's explicitly uh, noted onshore wind is, is now made provision for, albeit um, in the, the, the forthcoming round of the CFD, that we'll see a relatively small budget for that and a, and a cap, I think, a UK wide of about three and a half uh, gig, uh, gigawatts. So, um, but the, the, the point, you know, what more can we do? I think that the crucial point I want to get across is to couple the, the idea that onshore wind is for communities. Uh, and I think we can also extend this to, to offshore wind. But if communities can see an onshore wind site and they understand that a portion of that is owned by them and that a portion of the, the revenue surplus that is generated from that is going to be controlled by them and spent by the community for the community, I think you will see not just less opposition to onshore wind, but also a greater appetite for communities to partner with other local stakeholders to initiate new onshore wind um, uh, uh, initiatives. And I would include um, small-scale solar, uh, not necessarily small-scale, but I would include uh, solar and also hydro in this. So yeah, framing the, um, these onshore renewables as for the community, managed by the community, and owned by the community. And it may not be wholly, but certainly in part. And uh, I think obviously Scotland has, has, has done um, uh, fantastic things on this front, but um, many of the communities that I face, and we've done a lot of work around finance in the past, one of the big issues that they have is in low income communities, they don't have the local citizen finance to, to crowdsource in. What that means is that the community itself doesn't necessarily have the money within it to, um, to kickstart these initiatives. And with the absence of um, many of the, the revenue payments that we've seen, like the feed-in tariffs, renewable heat incentive, which have all uh, gone offline recently, that finance is harder to secure because pe the, these communities can't offer the same um, uh, return on, uh, on investment to investors. So they're having to rely much more on their own pockets, and that's difficult in low-income communities. So I would say the focus, if we're wanting to be, go um, big on onshore wind, and we're very serious at, about that and other on, onshore renewables, that we need to support these lower income and high fuel poverty communities to initiate their own projects. Just, just briefly then as a follow-up yeah, to yourself. Follow -up to um, yourself. I mean, do you think that community benefits should be a material consideration in the planning system then? Because at the moment it isn't. Projects have to be considered on their merits, what they look like, you know, where they're sited. That, that wider community benefit isn't something that, that is part of the determination of a project, and it's the planning system that's holding everything up at the moment. So there was an interesting piece of work by Aquaterra um, uh, released a few months ago, which compared a number of projects which were privately owned and had community benefit funds versus those which were community owned and had community owned managed benefit funds. And they identified that um, across these projects, if they compared the two groups, that there was 34 times more community benefit um, in terms of value uh, drawn down by community owned. Now that strikes me uh, if, if you are a local authority looking to support various climate, but also um, social welfare objectives, that, that seems very important to me. So I, I would encourage uh, government to support local authorities to prioritise planning where these projects are able to not only generate significant um, uh, surplus what, through low carbon activities, but to ensure that that surplus is managed by the community for other initiatives that um, may maybe deliver on that triple bottom line uh, value. So economic value, environmental value, and social value, and the planning regime, in my view, should support that. Okay, thanks. Can I get reflections from Tim Frost then on the question of onshore wind and solar? I think in, in, in terms of the kind of wider context of, of your question on planning as well. So I, I don't claim to be a, an expert in every uh, detail of the Scottish planning system. And I'd also say that you know, in Scotland, We've got a lot right in terms of uh, renewables deployment um, over the last uh, over the last decade, and we should uh, we should build on that success. But I, I guess the key points I'd make are, are first of all about pace. Um, and it was said earlier, we're not yet sort of treating this crisis like a crisis, and it is a climate crisis. And it 
the energy supply crisis. So we're looking throughout that chain. This isn't about running roughshod over what local communities want, but we know that you know onshore wind, about 80% of people support onshore wind, about 4% oppose, and, and you as politicians know better than me, it's quite hard to get 80% of people to agree uh, about anything. Um, so, you know, we, we have that bedrock of, of public support. So I think there is a case for looking very, very closely at how we can take any fat out of that system to ensure the projects, which might take only a, a couple of months to actually build, don't take 10 years to, to get to the point um, that they're being built. And I agree with the points that um, Dr. Hannan uh, mentioned around local benefits to, uh, to communities, which I think has been uh, very effective uh, in other countries as well. And I, th I think we've, we've made some progress on that here, but I think we can do more. Um, the third point I make is about investment in networks in particular, and I think that is something that we underestimate the challenge of uh, at the moment. Um, there was some uh, reference in the, uh, the UK energy security strategy to investment in advance of need, but when we look at the scale of renewables potential in Scotland that is still unexploited, even, even with the progress that we've made so far, getting that en energy to where it's needed and getting it to work productively and avoiding huge amounts of it being constrained off a lot of the time, which is deeply inefficient and, and quite rightly, um, deeply uh, unpopular and politically challenging. That is a huge challenge. And I think thinking strategically about how we are delivering uh, that network investment, not just for the onshore network, but also for the uh, for the North Sea as a strategic electricity generation asset uh, as well is really important. And I think obviously that is partly reserved and, and, and elements are potentially devolved as well. So um, uh, a, a complex challenge there, I think, for the Westminster government and the Scottish government to uh, to address together. Okay. And then the last point I would make is thinking about this as a systemic challenge. What we've, what we've sort of done on electricity is we've made huge progress in terms of decarbonisation, but we've, we've kind of done it in swim lanes. We're thinking about electricity and we're thinking about homes and we're thinking about transport and we're thinking about hydrogen, whereas actually the nature of the, of the transition we have over the coming decades is all of those things uh, merging together and interacting with one another. And the more we can think about that investment challenge and the planning challenge in a systemic way, for example, you know, how can we use excess renewable power to generate green hydrogen, uh, for example, um, will be really important um, in terms of how we achieve this in a way that's efficient, but also in a way that can drive uh, economic benefit beyond just low energy prices and into things like, you know, creation of new uh, industrial sectors uh, in Scotland and elsewhere in the UK. Okay, thanks. Um, Dr. Lowe's? Sure. So, um... Um, I'm, uh, Tim's talked about networks and, and Matthew's talked about uh, wind, and I think they're, they're both uh, two huge infrastructure planning challenges. The other is buildings, um, and there are huge amounts of planning regulations at a building level that need to be effectively ripped up in many ways if we're, if we're going to reach what, we, uh, what the targets say we need to reach and, and what most people want us to reach. Um, so the Scottish Government has made good headway in terms of the um, LHEAS work, which is around local um, homes and energy efficiency um, planning. Um, so that's good. Um, that can be continued because that is it's needed. It's it's local area based planning that looks at energy efficiency and heat networks potential. Um, but in terms of actual planning permission, um, there are huge amounts that still hold back the deployment of renewables and energy efficiency um, at a buildings level. Um, and the one that really gets me going is windows. The fact that in, in some cases you have to apply to get secondary glazing or, or even double glazing. Um, and this is linked, of course, to heritage and to conservation areas. But at some point, a judgment's got to be made. You know, what's more important? Do we do we manage the heritage and do we or do we meet our net zero targets? Um, and the example I'd give you is that there's a B&B um, &B I've stayed in a couple of times in Hillside Crescent, not far away from the Parliament building at all. Um, it has three metre high windows, probably solid stone walls, all single glazed, and it's a conservation area. Those buildings need to be decarbonised. Um, and there's really nothing that the owner of that hotel can do. Um, and you know, a decision's got to be made that says you're allowed to put double glazing in these buildings um, and you're allowed to insulate them. Because if you can't insulate them at all, um, then you're going to really, really struggle to meet not just your net zero targets, but to ever make that building affordable to heat. Um, and you need to remember that in the context of the fact that their energy costs will have basically tripled by next year. Um, so, so building level planning, not just for glazing, but also for energy efficiency, needs to be totally um, ripped up and started again. Okay. Okay, thanks for that. Um, can we move on to something a bit different, and that's blue hydrogen. Um, you know, we've seen governments, UK, Scottish government, certainly bigging up the potential role of blue hydrogen. 
but that was before the gas price started to peak, before we've seen the volatility. Where, where do you see blue hydrogen sitting now? Are, are the economics of it still sound, um, given this gas price? And you also note that you know, a lot of the CCS projects that are, that are being proposed around the UK have got blue hydrogen as part of that business case. Um, and, and do you see a role for blue hydrogen in terms of heating, or, or where, where, where should we be using it, or should we be using green? So a few thoughts on there. Um, it would be good to get back from you on, on blue hydrogen. Tim, uh, Lord, can we start with yourself? Sure. So I, I, think, I think in the relatively short term, there is potentially a role for blue hydrogen. Green is currently more expensive, and there are some industrial assets which are potentially quite well suited the production of blue hydrogen. I do think we need to think very carefully and cautiously about it um, for a couple of reasons. One is, I talked earlier about, you know, one of the big challenges around uh, international commodity markets, particularly gas, is not just the level of pricing, i.e. whether the price is high, but the volatility of price as we move through, you know, what is potentially a fairly sustained energy crisis and through a net zero transition, which will have significant volatility attached to it. Now, um, if we put too many eggs in the basket of blue hydrogen, we're essentially, you know, building that volatility in uh, to uh, to a really important market. So I think uh, while certainly there are potentially projects that, that that could be useful and could be um, economically uh, viable and which investors will want to will want to get behind, we need to be very careful in, in terms of thinking about you know, what do we need to believe for this to be economically viable in the medium, the long term, um, and what what sort of pricing um, situations would, would potentially undermine that. So. That's the first reason. The, the, the second is, you know, in terms of emissions, uh, blue hydrogen does still produce emissions. Ultimately, you know, if we're going to get to net zero, those will need to be uh, offset, captured uh, somewhere else, which obviously uh, impacts on the economics. So again, when we're thinking long term, we need to be thinking about the, the kind of whole system costs, if you like, of, uh, of blue hydrogen as opposed to, uh, to alternatives. Um, in terms of the use case for it, I fear you probably get broad agreement from the panel that hydrogen has a hugely important role to play. So if you look at the CCC, scenarios, they had something like 300 terawatt hours, I think, of hydrogen in 2050. That's about as much as electricity that we use today. That's a huge new sector coming from you know, a standing start in, what is it now, you know, 27 and a half years to, to 2050. Um, but principally, I think that that's about, um, in particular, heavy industry, uh, to some degree, heavy transports, um, and not really about home heating. I'm, I can't remember who it is that describes Heineken as, uh, sorry, um, hydrogen as the Heineken fuel in that it, it should uh, reach the parts of the economy that electrification can't. And I think you would struggle to find uh, independent analysts who would argue that, that um, hydrogen in home heating in particular uh, will ultimately be a lower cost solution than, than alternatives like electrification and heat networks. So um, to summarize, I think blue hydrogen potentially, but its role needs to be very, very carefully considered. Uh, and we need to make sure it's getting to the parts of the economy where it can be uh, most effective in comparison to the alternatives, and, and in most cases, that, that that probably isn't home heating. Yeah, um, Dr. Han, have you got anything to to add to that? Not a tremendous amount. I think everything Tim says is uh, is spot on. I think there's just a couple of points to to raise. Um, it, if it's about market formation and uh, and and signalling where we are going to take this hydrogen market, so I think the first and foremost is. Tim quite rightly points out, what are we needing it for? Where where will it be required? Um, I, I feel like that that debate is is starting to settle in, um, and I'm sure uh, Rich will come in in a moment around its role with regards to heat. But it's important to signal where will it be required. But if we're then then the secondary question to that is, you know, is it green or blue? And the more that you push on blue, the less that you are necessarily going to be able to uh, signal that, that, that there will be a future in green, and therefore you you are not necessarily sinking the same investment and effort into growing that supply chain. So I think there's a, there's a careful balance that needs to be struck. Uh, and obviously, there's a lot of vested uh, interests within the, the blue um, hydrogen camp um, that we need to be, be wary of, too. Um, I think the final point to, to raise is around green hydrogen. Uh, the more green hydrogen you bring in, the more that you're going to have to um, invest uh, in a timely fashion into renewables capacity. And with the, the shift in terms of ele electrification, whether that be heat or transportation, um, we're already going to need to uh, significantly increase our, our capacity. And that will be extremely challenging, dis even despite uh, some of the support we've seen um, in the energy security strategy uh, just before ESA with 50 gig of, uh, of offshore wind. So um, 
I think the point being, the stronger we go on hydro green hydrogen, the more we then need to consider other system implications, which are around renewables generation capacity being brought in at a, at a, at a, um, at a timely uh, moment, but also the, the, the reinforcement of the networks to cite um, uh, that, um, to bring that power into where it's needed. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Um, Dr. Lowe's. Uh, yeah, thank you. So um, we spent a lot of time talking about blue hydrogen, and I spent a lot of time thinking about it, despite the fact there's only one plant operating in the world um, in Canada um, that's using tar sands to produce you know, very, very dirty hydrogen that's a bit cleaner than it, it may otherwise have been. Um, so I just think we need to be very aware that the context of this is, is very underdeveloped still. Um, and actually, technologically, electrolysis, so producing hydrogen from electricity, is, is a more, uh, more developed um, pr approach. Um, I, I think there's a, a question over the economics here. So the analysis that I've seen suggests that by 2030, green hydrogen, so produced from uh, renewables, uh, just for the sake of producing hydrogen, will be cheaper than blue hydrogen. Um, and so what that means, um, and actually I should say that's changed even more because the gas price has gone up significantly. So that analysis was before the gas price increase. Um, and so what that means is that investment decisions being made today uh, may be undercut in 2030. Um, and so I think we'll see quite limited investment in blue hydrogen. Um, it may be in very specific places where there is a, a clear case for carbon capture because it relies uh, relies on some sort of storage facility. So that could be in industrial sites or linked to um, fossil fuel extraction areas. Um, in, in terms of the heating question, um, I guess there's, there's an energy security angle that we haven't really talked about for blue hydrogen, that is that you need more gas um, in the first place than you, you would have used if you're replacing um, gas with blue hydrogen, and that's because of the losses in the process. So if anything, this would be an energy insecurity strategy to go for blue hydrogen for heating because you'd be increasing your exposure to fossil gas. Um, and I was fairly staggered actually in the energy security strategy a couple of weeks ago to see um, a potential for up to five gigawatts of blue hydrogen because it does nothing for energy security. It weakens energy security, um, if anything, um, and so where to put it, though, and as, as Tim said, there's a huge role for hydrogen um, in the UK and in, in, in the world, um, in a net zero world. Um, but you need to be very strategic about where you put it. And this idea of just dumping it into the gas grid, which seems to be the suggestion from um, UK bays, would be incredibly inefficient and very expensive. Whereas what you need to do is target it towards the industries where it has most value. Um, and so the, the job of the government here really is to, to find those industries, to find out which, which are the bits that you use the hydrogen for and how do you get it to them. A huge chunk is actually fertilizer production. That is the biggest use of hydrogen in the world um, outside of um, the um, oil and gas um, extraction industry. So, so fertilizer is one to aim for, but there will be other industries that use it too. Um, and the other huge one is in seasonal storage. So we're, we're going to need something to balance out the energy system over the course of seasons um, of the year. Um, and hydrogen is seen to be one of those things. Um, and with the potential for wind in Scotland and, of course, already curtailed wind um, and excess generation, it seems to me there's a very sensible case for thinking about that particular strategic investment in Scotland. OK, thanks very much. Um, certainly don't think we want a, an insecurity strategy at the moment. Um, can I just ask a final question then about um, fracked gas? Um, do, you, do you see uh, gas from fracking uh, having uh, any bearing in terms of uh, energy supply and the, and the cost of living crisis um, you know, now, in the years to come, short term, long term? Uh, any, any quick thoughts on that? Um, Tim Lord, do you want to start? Sure. Very, very briefly, I, I, I think it's worth going back to the original objectives of what a strategy should look to achieve, and that is about overall uh, reducing prices and reducing energy insecurity. And I, and I think the issue with fracking is, is essentially that, that it won't have a big impact on prices. So the UK at the moment is you know, around, I think, a bit less than 1% of total global gas production. We're an extremely well interconnected market, which has had some advantages for us in, in, in the past. Um, if we frack gas or if, if we produce more gas, it will go straight into that market. And it, it seems to me, and I think all the analysis indicates, it's quite unlikely that that will have a significant impact on prices, unless you do things like introduce price controls or export controls uh, to keep it here in the UK, in which case I think you probably, I don't think you, I think you almost certainly would struggle to get any investors to, to, to get behind that because of the uncertainty that that creates. So I think there's obviously a lot of kind of heat in the, in the 
we forgive the pun in, in the fracking debate, but, but, but to me, it's really about will it help to achieve those objectives in the short, medium or long term? Um, and, and in that context, it feels a little bit like a red herring. In particular, when you layer on top of that, the challenges obviously of delivering fracking at, at scale, given you know, the, 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 the need to, to bring communities on site. And, and we know from uh, plenty of polling evidence that, that fracking is, is less popular than a number of alternative technologies. So I think you know, in some ways there's too much heat in the debate, but, but, but the question really is, can it really um, contribute to the kinds of public policy outcomes we're trying to achieve through an energy security strategy? And, and to me, uh, it's certainly not clear that it would. Yeah. Okay. And uh, any uh, brief comments on this from Dr. Lowe's? Um, I, I just echo um, Tim's points, I think. And I'd also say from a Scottish context, um, I previously worked for um, Scotland Gas Networks. And, and when we looked at this um, then, there were only relatively small amounts of, of potential for fracking in Scotland um, and towards the, the more southern areas of Scotland. Um, and so from a Scottish impact, I think it would be um, quite limited. Um, I think that the, the reality is that you could produce some gas from fracking if you wanted to. And there are significant, significant environmental consequences of doing that that um, the industry does not talk about in terms of water use um, and waste um, and leakage of methane, which is another huge global issue. Um, and the impact would be um, slight. Um, it would be there'd be a possible impact in terms of quantities of gas produced, but the impact on price would be negligible, as the I think the, the former boss of Quadrilla himself said, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Dr. Hannan, any final points before I hand back to the convener? No, nothing more to add on that. Thank okay. you. Thanks, convener. Great. Thank you very much, Mark. Let me bring in uh, Jackie Dunbar to be followed by Liam Kerr. Jackie, over to you, please. Uh, thank you, convener. And I realise that we're running out of time again, so I will keep my, my questions brief. Um, uh, to, uh, we were hearing earlier, um, I think it was from Dr Lowe's, um, regarding the, uh, what, what the what support should be offered um, for folk going forward um, as the, the, the price increase hits people. Um, can, can one, first of all, can I ask, how significant do you think the, the impact will be on the increase uh, in the, uh, regarding the, the cost of energy in regards to fuel poverty? Uh, and how can the with the support um, already announced by the UK and Scottish government, what, you know, how, how, can we, how can that help and is there anything else that, that could be done? Well, I think there's, um, there's lots that could be done and this is really a matter of political will here. Um, so what's been offered already, um, I think the council tax rebate is um, England only, I think. I'm not sure about that, I'd have to check. Um, but a council tax rebate, um, and a loan on energy bills. Now, the loan on energy bills only really helps people in the short term. So I think that measure can effectively be discounted. Um, I think it's a, a slight gimmick. Um, in terms of what people need, um, I'm afraid it, it's simply cash. Um, and, and that needs to be found however it can, um, because these are going to be very, very difficult times. Um, and so if you think an average house's gas bill might be going up by two and a half times by next winter, um, that's potentially an extra thousand pounds about going a year. Um, and at the same time, the price of food is going up as well, in part because of the energy price um, rise, but in part because of other things. Um, so really, in the short term, I think it has to be just, just cash support to people um, and, and being able to identify those people. And I know that sounds um, particularly grim for the first um, morning back after work, after a holiday, but um, that's the sad reality. Um, in the longer term, um, I think actually the Scottish government has got it quite right with regards to energy in terms of the package of measures that are available at the moment. Um, and so the fact that you can get a grant um, and a loan at the same time to do up your house um, is something that should be applauded. Um, and so the, the long term package is there, but it needs to be utilised more. Um, but in the short term, the availability of cash um, needs to be there for those that most need it. OK, thank you. Dr Hannan, do you have anything to add in regards to that? Because I was also going to ask you, because you mentioned about the further price cap happening um, in the autumn. Can I ask you um, what the impact of that will be on top of, of the question that I've already asked and if there's any other future measures you think could, could or should be put in place? Yeah, absolutely. So, as I say, Cornwall um, inside forecasting that potentially by... October the 1st, we'll be looking at uh, your average dual fuel bills at 2,600. So that's an additional 600 plus pounds on, on top of where we are currently at. 
Um, and I, I think that you know the the number one way of of supporting the least wealthy families, um, who we, we must say that the higher that the cost of living. Uh, the, the, the higher the cost of living and the cost of energy and everything else, the less disposable income that we have to be able to invest in our homes to reduce our energy costs. So it, it's this, it's this. We find ourselves in, in quite the, quite a predicament. So state, the state needs to step in, and they will most likely need to step in and support homes that otherwise, pre-energy crisis, were in a position to be able to invest in a retrofit. Um, whether it's maybe just simply loft insulation or, or a more comprehensive retrofit to reduce energy costs. So there are homes that aren't, that weren't fuel poor, and the na um, nas uh, National Energy Action predict that potentially by October the 1st, uh, if energy bills reach £3,000, which is not impossible, we could see 8.5 million homes in the UK um, uh, fuel poor, which is you know more than double where we, we currently are. So. What we need is the energy supplier obligation, currently uh, ECO, uh, to, to be increased in terms of funding and for that funding to come online as soon as possible. Now, this is problematic because Bayes have just announced, uh, I think it's April the 1st, that they were um, only going to increase the funding from £640 million pounds to £1 billion. Pounds, and that would uh, see um, effectively uh, over the course of those four years, 450,000 homes in the UK supported with efficiency measures. So that's about 1, uh, 112,000 per annum. Now, if we look at what we were doing 10 years ago, that's about a tenth of the scale of investment that we were making, or in terms of a tenth of the measures. So we need to expand ECO. It needs to be an order of magnitude uh, larger in size. And that money, need, as I think Tim pointed this out earlier, that money needs to come online now. It should have come online when the um, the October price cap rise hit last year, and we knew this was already starting to happen. But if we were serious about this, we could UK-wide be insulating hundreds of thousands of homes before the October price cap rise, because we were already doing that 10 years ago. And I think the final point to make is that whilst there are elements of eco which are to be commended, um, for instance, there's a much greater focus on fuel poor and uh, multiple measures, essentially deeper retrofit, um, that we can't forget the people kind of in the middle who are they're somewhere between that they're not fuel poor, but they're also feeling the pinch to the extent where they're wanting to make these efficiency measures. So what, what do we have there uh, to support to support these families um, who are uh, kind of just about managing? So I think there's a there's a significant amount of effort to be made, and I don't know what to what extent Scottish government has the reserve powers uh, to make a difference here. As I understand, this is a is a UK policy, but uh, pressure could potentially be be applied. Okay, thank you very much. And as I said, I'm trying to keep it very brief. So if I can ask um, Tim Lord if he has got anything to add to anything that, that I've already asked, and then I'll pass it back to yourself, convener. No, nothing to add given time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jackie. I think uh, Monica Lennon has a supplemental in this area. Monica. Thank you, Convener, and good morning to the, the panel. Um, it's been a really interesting session, so I was quite happy to, to mostly listen today. Um, I was struck earlier on by one of the comments about the behaviour changes people can make, and I accept there are things that we can all do, but it strikes me we don't have a, a behaviour crisis here. It is a, a market crisis and a, a system crisis. Um, one view is that increasing democratic ownership of Scotland's energy resources could help to support local energy cooperatives and smaller energy companies. Um, I just wonder if our panel have a view about the potential role that a Scottish publicly owned energy company could play in protecting consumers and the climate and providing clean, green and affordable energy. Um, I know people want to hear um, immediate solutions, so we don't have bills of £3,000 a year, but thinking about what a future energy system could look like in, this, in the medium to longer term, what could the Scottish Government be doing? And maybe come to uh, Dr Hannan first of all. Yes, thank you. I, I know this has been discussed uh, over the years and something which 
I, I would say versus say community energy is something that we, we haven't seen that kind of public ownership, whether it's at a local, regional, devolved level, um, come, come to the fore. But I, I personally think there's, there's a lot to be said for a not-for-profit model, whether that is community or public owned or some blend of the two, and where those profits are, are reinvested into, um, into the catchment area of that supplier. Now, it's not just um, the fact that they're, they're reinvested in that area, but also they're reinvested in a way that supports the strategic aims of the individuals or, or organizations that own that, that company. So in this case, it would be a combination of the government and, and the people of Scotland, which seems to me a very sensible strategy when you are dealing with two uh, conjoint crises of, of energy and climate. Um, so I, I, I also think there would be an opportunity for such a, uh, an organisation to operate alongside other um, uh, other strategic bodies like the the uh, National uh, Infrastructure Bank and, and Scotland's uh, National Investment Bank too, uh, to be able to invest in ways um, that, that could support that supplier to um, deliver cheaper, greener tariffs, um, and and uh, as well as, as, as meet wider policy objectives. I'm conscious of time, so I'll, I'll pause there for the other panellists. Thank you. Thank you very much. You don't have to uh, chip in, but if our other panels want to, to provide a brief answer, um, not getting an indication. So back to you, convener. OK, thank you, Monica. Let me bring in Liam Kerr. Liam, please. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, panel. Uh, Dr. Lowe's, I'll direct my first question to you, if I may. The, uh, I was quite surprised to hear your comments earlier that North Sea gas might run out by 2035. I presume this is a reference to the NSTA discussion of investment rather than actual reserves. And I wonder if in your answer you might just clarify before we set any hairs running. Uh, now, on that point, gas generates currently about 36% of UK energy. And imported gas, as I understand it, is the last unit bought to satisfy demand, and that contributes to the overall price. Now, we also know that imported LNG from Qatar, for example, has two to three times the carbon footprint of that which is locally generated. So, therefore, Dr Lowe's, does it stand to reason that one way to reduce energy prices and push us on the journey to net zero, whilst demand exists, is to ensure more domestic gas? Well, uh, my reference is to uh, National Grid's figures um, in their future energy strategies, which are publicly available, um, and they show a rapid decline, which we've seen already continued, basically as a straight line, um, out to 2035, 2040. Um, I'm not saying it will be totally gone, but it will be expected to be in those forecasts, at least at very low levels. Um, I do actually have a concern with the idea of um, increasing investment in the short term, um, and it's a risk around long-term impacts. So if we do um, go even more quickly for North Sea oil and gas extraction, I worry that we end up in a situation where we're even more exposed um, even more quickly. Um, so that's, that's my fundamental concern about going um, even quicker. Um, I think a more sensible approach might be a, a slower and more strategic extraction um, to, to balance out the risk of imports and own um, supply um, in the shorter term. Um, I'm not sure I quite agree that the the, the second unit, the, the, sorry, the last unit that we, we buy is, is always the imported one. Um, if we look at um, the imports and exports, the balance of gas over the past six months or even year, um, we have still been exporting plenty of gas. So um, it really is a global market. Um, and the price of a unit of gas reflects the global market, not the, the price of North Sea gas. Um, and I guess a really um, simple way of seeing that is looking at the profits um, of some of the um, UK-based oil and gas extraction firms over the past year, because they've been effectively um, receiving income that they weren't um, expecting to receive. Um, I think we need to think very carefully about gas imports. LNG, um, much of which um, has historically come from um, Qatar, is high carbon, um, significantly higher carbon than UK produced gas, significantly higher carbon um, than um, gas that we import from Norway as well. Um, and what we've seen over the past couple of years, which has happened very quietly, is the importation of um, shale gas from the US um, as LNG as well. Um, and that gas potentially has an even higher carbon footprint than that um, of LNG that we're importing from Qatar. 
Um, so I think there are um, uh, balances and trade-offs that need to make against all of these sources of gas. Um, and this is a geopolitical issue um, like um, no other, really. Um, but I, I urge caution against the idea of going as quickly as you can um, for uh, North Sea oil and gas in case we make it run out even quicker. Uh, very grateful. Just um, <clears throat> for the avoidance of doubt, those were spice uh, figures from the energy price crisis impacts on Ramazine in Scotland that I was quoting. Uh, Tim Lord, I'll direct my second question to you, if I may. The, uh, according to Spice, again, one of the key drivers of the recent increase in the wholesale price of gas was a relatively windless summer in 2021, which made it difficult to generate wind energy. Now, you said earlier. Tim Lord, that uh, we need another reliable way to satisfy demand. And in fact, the reference that Dr. Lowe's made earlier to the National Grid, the future energy scenario, specifically suggests that nuclear uh, might be a significant part of that in our journey to net zero. So, Tim Lord, what is your view? Is that reliable source nuclear generation? Um, and what impact do you think that new nuclear could have on the price to consumer if it can provide that reliable baseload? Sure. So, so I guess on, on your first point in, in terms of the wholesale price of gas last summer, I don't think renewables performance impacted on the wholesale price of gas. I think it has a, a pretty marginal impact on the price in electricity markets at a certain point and some of the, some of the steepness of, of the peaks in, in quite short windows. Um, uh, but but the, clearly the key driver over the last um, 12 to 18 months and over the next 12 to 18 months will, will be the wholesale price of gas. I think in terms of your question on, on nuclear, I mean, it, it's very clear that the cheapest and also the, the most net zero compatible UK electricity system will be very renewables heavy uh, over the next uh, 30 years. And, but clearly that needs to operate in tandem with other technologies. You know, people who work in the energy sector will, will know that the wind doesn't work when the wind is blowing, uh, when the wind is not blowing and, and solar uh, faces uh, similar intermittency challenges, but I think they, they can be managed. I think what that means is you need a suite of technologies to, to support that. You know, you're going to move from a position where gas is the backbone of the energy system. I think it's earlier it's provided between 35 and 43 percent of energy for the last 20 or 30 years, and that, and that is going to change. In electricity, offshore wind will increasingly be the backbone of the system. So the question is, is what works around that? And I think you can have a combination of technologies there. I think. Uh, storage uh, has really significant potential and is reducing in price, but clearly challenges around long-term storage. Uh, I think green hydrogen uh, can play a potential role in the electricity uh, generation sector as well. And I think nuclear um, absolutely uh, has a role to play because it brings different things to the system uh, than renewables bring. Clearly, the unit price uh, will be somewhat higher than renewables, but, but it obviously it provides uh, reliability and other advantages which can complement um, renewables and other technologies, I, I think, quite well. For me, the key thing about nuclear is, is though not how many gigawatts do we think we're going to have in 2050, is what are we going to do in the next five to ten years to deliver investment, you know, reflecting the fact that we haven't built a new nuclear power station in the country since 1995. How do you get investment in the next five or ten years to get that supply chain moving and hopefully to deliver the kinds of cost reductions uh, which, uh, for example, South Korea have seen by taking a, a fleet approach uh, to deploying new nuclear power? Thank you for that. I'll, I'll stick with you for my final question, Tim Lord, if I may. I, and, and thank you for that interesting answer. You talked about the next five years on nuclear. Uh, you may not be able to answer this question. I, I do appreciate. Um, and if any of the other panellists can, I'd be very grateful. But, Tim Lord, in January, I asked the Scottish Government what impact closing Hunterson B and Torness would have on consumer energy bills. Now, the Scottish Government was unable to tell me because apparently they haven't uh, modelled that. And I then went on to ask what is the price of electricity generated by Hunston B and Torness uh, in, in an attempt to kind of reverse engineer the, the answer. Um, but again, the Scottish Government doesn't know the answer to that, which I have to say I find rather surprising. But do you have or, or could any of the panel source that data? And in any event, do you, are you able to theorise what impact shutting these two generation stations in Scotland might have on consumer energy bills? I'm afraid I don't have that, that data and I, I, I haven't looked into that question specifically. I guess in, in, in terms of the broader point, um, you know, the, the existing nuclear fleet is ageing. Um, and many of them will close down. As you say, some have closed recently. Some will, most of the rest will close over the next 10, uh, 10 years or so. Um, 
Uh, but in terms of the impact that will have on consumer prices, I'm, af I'm afraid I haven't looked at that um, in, in any detail for those uh, for those plants in particular. I don't know if any of the other panellists have. Thank you. I, I wonder if either of the other panellists, I appreciate it's a slightly niche question to drop on you just in committee there, but uh, if either of you have anything to say on that. And if not, I sh uh, Dr. Hannan, you look like you might want to come in. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it's just, just, it's not a direct answer to your, your question because I don't have the data uh, like Tim, but I would say that if we're removing that from the uh, from Scotland's energy supply, then we are by default having to rely on other forms of baseline. And currently our go-to um, without nuclear is looking at other fossil fuels, gas most notably, but we have also seen coal occasionally peak back onto the grid to support um, but also in Scotland would be relying more on nuclear in the uh, outside of Scotland, but within the UK. So I think some of the developments we're seeing in the energy security strategy uh, and, and, you know, the significant support for new nuclear, um, Scotland, you know, will have to keep one eye on, on developments there and the, and the likely costs that that will incur. And we've seen um, year on year uh, delays and cost increases to, to, to Hinkley point C. I think the final point to, to raise is that Scotland need some kind of baseline. Uh, Tim pointed out some, some important technologies there, but we have one that we, we are um, developing ourselves um, just off the coast of Orkney, the north of Scotland, in terms of tidal stream. And I, I think there's opportunities there and also other forms of uh, tidal range that can be located elsewhere in the UK and, and innovative forms of storage, uh, like we've seen a Scottish-based company, Gravitricity, using X, um, X, X mine shafts for this. So the, the indirect cost of knocking nuclear off the system is having to support research and development to fund new technologies to fill that baseline gap. Very grateful to you all. Thank you, Convener. Liam, uh, let me bring in Natalie D jo uh, Dawn, sorry, who is joining us uh, remotely. Natalie, over to you, please. Thanks very much, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, yeah, we've touched on a, a lot this morning. Um, I just want to refer to the, the price cap that we've seen. So, obviously, Dr Lowe's, you've pointed out already this morning, people haven't really felt the impact of this yet, and they're really going to struggle, especially with prices set to rise again and the, the colder uh, weather coming in later in the year. Does the panel feel the off-gems price cap is fit for purpose and the off-gems proposals to boost resilience in the energy sector, for example, through financial stress testing for suppliers and increasing the number of times a year that the price cap can actually be adjusted will make a material impact on the market? Um, sorry, sorry, apologies. I'm putting that to um, Tim Lord first. Thank you. Yeah, so I... Uh... In terms of the price cap, I, I, I think we need to be careful about sort of blaming too much on the price cap, as, as some have, in the sense that, you know, when prices do something like this, consumers are going to feel pain and politicians and governments are going to need to think pretty hard about how to respond to that. And to some degree, you know, to Richard's point earlier, the price cap is, is sort of protecting consumers in the short term uh, from some of the, uh, in particular, the volatility and, and of course, the, the price rises as well. I think Ofgem is right to look at um, the issues that it is looking at in terms of, you know, is, is that six month window the right window or are there circumstances where it should change uh, more quickly? Uh, and secondly, clearly there were issues around uh, the financing and the um, uh, forward contracting models of some of the, uh, and, and uh, frankly, the financial stability of some of the suppliers who were, who were able to operate in the market when, when times were good, as it were, um, but then obviously have, have gone out of business when, when times are bad. Um, I think inevitably when you have these kind of price rises, businesses in that sector are going to struggle. But I think there is a real question about whether uh, we have um, enough resilience built into the system. So I think Ofgem uh, is uh, is right to be to be looking at that. So I think it is possible for the price cap model to continue to work. I sort of I'm I'm, I'm sort of in the camp where I don't like it very much in principle, but I think um, it perhaps works better than the alternatives in practice, as is often the case with. Uh, uh, with things in energy, um, but I do think uh, you know the implication of your question is right that, that there are things that Ofgem can and should be doing both to to make the price cap perhaps work a little better for consumers, but also to make sure that there's the resilience uh, and and that the barriers to entry in the supply market uh, are appropriate to uh, to protect consumers. Thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, could, could I ask Dr. Hannan to to I'm not sure if you have anything to expand on, and if I could just add. 
No, would you agree that the price cap should not be able to be lifted by? Sorry, I, I know there's obviously um, some um, discussion over um, timescales, but would you agree that it shouldn't be able to be lifted by more than a set percentage point within a financial year, which would provide some form of certainty for consumers? Because obviously it's just been such a huge jump. Um, so if I could ask Dr Hannan to come in on that, thanks. Yeah, I think that's a, it's an important question with regards to certainty for consumers, but the, the more certainty that consumers have with, with regards to price, I think the less certainty some suppliers have with regards to their, you know, their sort of financial operations and whether they're able to cover costs. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I would hesitate to to take such a step as it as that as you outline without understanding what the implications would be for suppliers. And we've already seen so many go bust, and the cost of that is you know has been has been uh, eye watering. And uh, consumers are carrying the, the can for that. So the Office for Budget uh, Budgetary Responsibility have suggested that bulb um, what, at the time one of uh, the UK's largest suppliers. Um, it going bust is going to cost us 2.2 billion pounds over the next couple of years. So that's that's being carried forward onto our bills today. Um, so we cannot make adjustments to the price cap in a way that will see more suppliers go bust because that will, by default, hurt consumers down the line because they are paying for that. The, the other very quick point I'd raise as well. I think there's a a joint issue with the price cap that on the positive, um, sorry, on the negative side, it delays the pain. It kind of delays the inevitable. We're, we're simply delaying the, the rising cost. We're just not feeling it straight away. But the positive is that it buys us time. And that time, I feel that we, we have maybe not used um, in, in, in the most effective way. And I'll defer to my, without echoing what I said earlier, defer to my point about investing in energy demand reduction now rather than waiting until autumn, which seems to be the, the Chancellor of the Exchequer's uh, plan uh, with regards to the autumn statement to see if energy prices are still high. But, but the price cap going forward will reflect the prices today. So um, I, I would encourage us to use the time that we have now. Um, and of course, this is why, why the committee is running the inquiry today. But um, we, the price cap gives us that time and we must use it wisely. Thanks very much, Dr. Han. I'll extend this to Dr. Lowe's and just add a, a final sort of supplementary on. Um, if, if, if you could expand on, on what I've already um, um, asked, and if you feel that the, the price cap should be extended to regulate non-domestic customers, so for example, those not on de default tariffs and those who are not currently on the gas, gas grid um, and are, for example, heating homes by fuel oil or petroleum? Um, I think, so the first thing I'd say is it's worth thinking why the price cap was first introduced, and it was to protect people from excess charges, um, particularly those um, so-called sticky customers that have never switched. Um, and so I actually think the, the price cap's been, um, despite the fact it is a significant intervention in what should be a, a private competitive market, of course, I think it's had significant value in protecting the most exposed and the most um, vulnerable to bad practices. Um, and I'm slightly cautious around the idea of limiting the cap rises, because I think that's that's almost an intervention too far. That almost, you're, you're fundamentally asking a question about, is the, the market no longer fit for purpose? Um, and I'm not sure that's the case. Um, and if you were to limit the price cap rises, you would effectively be forcing companies bankrupt. So um, I think um, that wouldn't be um, a sensible thing to do. Um, I do, however, think um, that if if you think how many companies have gone bankrupt and what that costs the average person, which is £34 for this year, clearly some sort of tough regulation on the companies was required um, and evidence around hedging um, is clearly needed. Companies need to show that they've bought enough power so they're not exposed to X level of risk. Um, and so in, in some circumstances, that regulation um, has failed. I think the question, I, there are two things. So um, on oil, um, they're often the forgotten, the forgotten households. Um, so often more rural, uh, no connection to the gas grid. Prices have also doubled, at least for oil. Um, yes, I mean, there is, if some people are covered already, um, you'd expect the, the same treatment for others. Um, and the oil market is is a very, very different market to the gas market. Um, I don't know how it could be regulated. I think it would be very difficult. Um, but I actually think more about regulating the market, it's more about targeted support um, and finding where people need the most help. 
Um, and so I think um, enhanced support could potentially be offered to oil customers, um, depending on that level of risk, and that level of exposure. Um, but the other I'd highlight is those people on prepayment meters, um, because they will be the most exposed, the most vulnerable. It's almost summer, and um, people won't have the heating on, um, and they won't have felt any of those price rises yet on their prepayment meters. Um, and later in the year, um, when the heating comes on in October, November, December, that's when the impacts will really be felt. Um, and those people um, on price, um, on, on prepayment meters, because other people are on direct debits and those costs are spread across the year, that's when they'll really feel it. Um, and so I'd, I'd suggest some real consideration of enhanced support for people on prepayment meters, um, because they are the most exposed um, and they are generally the least able to take on that risk and that, that additional um, financial pressure. Thank you very much, Dr. Lowe's. I'll pass back to the convener now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Natalie. Um, we're running slightly behind, but, but I'd appreciate it if I could uh, ask one final question of Tim Lord. Uh, Tim, one of the requirements you mentioned to, to mobilise private capital to finance retrofitting and decarbonisation in the short term was the development of what you refer to as better investment frameworks. Um, given the need, the, the critical need to mobilise uh, that wall of ca uh, private capital into, into this sector, I wonder if you could elaborate on the specifics of, of what you would like to see in terms of better investment vehicles. Sure. So I think if you look across the economy, actually, the investment requirement for, for net zero, as I mentioned earlier, you know, there's different estimates, but they're all very large numbers. The ABI one is, is 2.7 trillion to. Uh, to 2035 UK wide, um, and that's you know broadly comparable to, to the CCC uh, and other analysis. In one sector, in renewables, we have a really good investment in terms of the contract for difference, and being you know the kind of virtuous circle emerging there. Obviously, you know the, the, the Scottish government have done, for example, you have the Scotland leasing round, so we have a really good project pipeline. We have an investable instrument. We have a low cost of capital that translates into low cost for consumers. So there, we've created a virtuous circle, and essentially, what we need to do is replicate that in other sectors, whether it's DCS or hydrogen or electricity networks, et cetera. I think in homes that, I don't think there's a kind of silver bullet to how you you, you deliver that, that investment framework. Obviously, in some ways it's easier in the power sector where you're dealing with you know, large infrastructure projects built by people whose job it is to build large infrastructure projects in a way that a homeowner doesn't see their role in life as, as you know, deciding what their heating system should be. So there are different challenges, but I think, you know, first of all, we need more clarity of direction around where we are going on heating policy so that we know you know which combination of technologies we're using in which parts of the country for example in, in with a bit more specificity uh, than we do at the moment i think secondly we need to create the conditions for that through uh, as i talked about earlier better consumer information and so on and then thirdly i think we need to think really carefully about how and where we use government funding to, to kind of pump prime uh, private investors to be able to come in at scale um, in two ways one, one is around how do we reduce that cost of capital for consumers one of the reasons the Green Deal failed um, a decade or so ago was because the cost of loans was, you know, consumer cost, 8 to 10 percent, for example. Government doesn't have to pay for everyone uh, and certainly shouldn't be paying for, for the more well-off necessarily um, the full cost of them uh, improving energy efficiency or decarbonising heating. But it can help to uh, reduce that cost of capital and then enable private capital um, to, uh, to flow in behind that. Um, but I think I think with, with that kind of combination uh, of measures, and, and the other one is about how, how we look at this in a in a regional and localised way. So, and I think the committee's looked at this question before around different local authorities, for example, and, and how you can potentially package some of those retrofit programmes in ways that enables large scale, uh, which again can bring big institutional uh, investors in. Because I think what you see is genuine willingness in the financial services sector now to provide that capital, genuine recognition that this is the key growth area of the economy and, and a genuine appreciation that for our customers, this is the right way to go. Um, but at the moment, I, I think the, um, the investment vehicles are not, are not quite there. And I, and I think that can be solved. You know, it doesn't have to be solved by government paying for everything. It can be solved by government setting the framework in a slightly different way. Uh, thank you very much, Tim. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hannan, and thank you, Dr. Lowes. That brings us to the end of our allocated time. It's been an excellent session. You've raised a, a number of uh, challenges uh, and a number of potential solutions, so we very much appreciate your time this morning. And that brings us to the end of the public session. We will now move into a private session. Thank you, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.